you know, to domesticate a plant or a fungus or an animal or whatever is essentially to form a symbiosis with it. That's what, that's what you're doing. And usually that partner benefits. You know, if we uh, form a partnership with mushrooms because they produce psilocybin, which we happen to appreciate in various ways, well, we grow the mushrooms. So that serves the mushrooms purpose as well. And, uh, and it's like that, that same dynamic happens in any kind of symbiotic uh, relationship. Welcome everyone to another Mind and Heart opening episode on Just Tap In. I'm your host Emilio and do we have the treat for you today? Joining us on the podcast is a true visionary and pioneer in the reemergence of psychedelics in the mainstream culture. Dennis McKenna has conducted research in ethnopharmacology for over 40 years and performed extensive ethnobotanical fieldwork in the Peruvian, Colombian, and Brazilian Amazon. He is a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute and was a key investigator in the Hawaska Project, the first biomedical investigation of ayahuasca. He is the younger brother of the late Terence McKenna, who has been known as a psychedelic guru and mystic. In 2018, he birthed the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the transformation of global consciousness through educational experiences that interweave our collective intelligence, science, and ancestral wisdom. In this conversation, we will explore the depths of Dennis McKenna's mind through the lens of spending his life studying plant hallucinogens and traditional medicines and becoming a leader in psychedelic discovery and the use of plant medicines such as psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca. Enjoy this truly special conversation and keep getting exposed to the greatest ideas and teachers for humanity's next evolution by hitting a subscribe on this channel to never miss an episode and join a growing community of wisdom seekers like you. And without further ado, we introduce the man who has the heart of an explorer and who has been called the real life Indiana Jones, Dennis McKenna. Dennis McKenna, welcome to the podcast. How are you, brother? Very well. How are you? Very good. Very honored to be here. Um, we're about to get into a lot of mind-blowing concepts, and I really just wanted to begin with your inspiration in the journey of psychedelics and going into this from a completely new uh, viewpoint, a Western viewpoint, because we know psychedelics have been around for thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> the ancient civilizations have used these as tools to travel through the mind and explore consciousness and get messages from the universe. And talking about messages from the universe, one of the main inspirations behind your journey into this psychedelic education that you've gone through was cosmology and astronomy. So I kind of wanted to get into a little bit about your inspirations for getting into this because at that point the the psychedelic movement was not that well known only in other parts of the world that were very remote and you actually had to go there to find this information. So Maybe let's start with some of your early inspirations into getting into all of these concepts. Well, uh, yeah, my, my, so my interest in cosmology and astronomy and, and that sort of thing has not waned, you know. I mean, I, I was interested in that before I discovered psychedelics, really, and, and that continues. And, and I was kind of, I mean, I was curious about everything, but I was I was curious about uh, cosmology because uh, you know cosmology is the big picture, and cosmology is like the biggest of pictures. You know, where what is the universe? Where did it come from? How is it evolving? Mm. Where is our place in it? You know, is an obvious question. So those kinds of questions really fascinated me as a young person and an aspiring uh, astrophysicist. I wanted to study cosmology. Mm. Uh, and it, 
it, it's become a hobby, but I, I couldn't become a professional cosmologist because honestly, I was terrible in math and math is something you have to master if you're going to do cosmology. I'm, I'm at the level of the layman's understanding of things like string theory and, you know, mm. quantum uh, quantum processes and so on. So I read the uh, the popular science articles about it, but I don't read the papers in the physics, you know, yeah. in the physics journal because they're just beyond me. And I think that, you know, how does this tie into uh, the interest in psychedelics? Well, psychedelics sort of opens your mind to these big pictures. Psychedelics delivers... Uh, a message or insights, you might say, about why we are here, you know, mm. and, and, and often you feel like you do gain insights as to, you know, our place in nature. And, and, and I think that's one of the insights that psychedelics helps us, uh, helps us formulate, you know, and as a species, I, I think, you know, I, I think you would probably agree that we're way out of harmony with nature. We're way out of sync with nature. And mm -hmm. that's a big part of our problem. And I think psychedelics can give us uh, insights maybe into uh, how to get realigned with nature. So yeah. those insights are useful. Yeah, you talk a lot about becoming partners with the biospheric community of species that we have all around us. And I think, you know, when we're going into these psychedelic experiences, you've had over 500 ayahuasca journeys. Um, personally, I, I've i never done an ayahuasca journey yet. So, mom, if you're listening to this, you can breathe now. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to know because 500 is a lot. It's a big number. I think it's it's a big number to grasp onto, especially in these very profound experiences that shape and reshape the way you see the world. Have there been any patterns that you've gained from this this medicine and maybe some messages that the plants have been telling you maybe recently as well, just around what's going on in the world and how we can reconnect? Mm -hmm. Well, in the first place, uh you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have stopped counting how many ayahuasca experience I've taken. I've taken. It's not the number; it's the quality. Yeah, you know, quality. I mean, I've probably actually taken a few more than five hundred in my <laughs> lifetime. But but the thing is, uh, you know, they're not all the super profound experiences. I mean, certain yeah. experiences stand out. They don't always rise to that to that level, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're almost always interesting. You almost always learn something from them. Uh, so, you know, I guess that's a reason why I keep taking it. You know, some people say, well, uh, you know, I mean, I think it was Ram Das who said, once you get the message, hang up the phone, mm -hmm. you know, and I have never agreed with that, at least from my own experience, because, I don't feel I've reached a place where I've learned all there is that I, that all there is to be learned or that I can learn from ayahuasca. It keeps yeah. coming up with new stuff, new surprises, new insights. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you don't hang up on a teacher that you value and respect. And that's how I think of ayahuasca. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that, that's my, my current relationship with it and yeah. and it it's given me well i think me and a lot of people i think ayahuasca maybe more than other psychedelics helps us to focus on our relationship with nature and our place in nature because of well i, I suppose other things do as well but ayahuasca seems to be one of those uh, psychedelics, mushrooms too, mm. occasionally that that carry a message about our relationship with nature, and and these days more of a cautionary uh, cautionary message because we're we're getting out of harmony with nature, and uh, until we can come to terms with that, all the challenges that we face, I think, with respect to climate change and everything that's happening. Uh, 
you know, we're not going to be able to respond to these until we have the uh, sort of right alignment with nature. And I think psychedelics can help bring that about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think even going down this, this rabbit hole, the reason I asked the question was because recently I had the chance to look into the documentary that you created with Brian Rose from London Real called Reconnect. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see you um, in your element, you know, having this this ayahuasca experience. And there was one day because it was a multiple day experience. There was one day where it really hit you um, and you, you saw a lot of visions, a lot of, you know, violence, a lot of negative things that are going on in the world. And, you know, these messages you know, they could be coming from the mind, but I, I believe, or maybe we can also get into that, that the plants are also giving us this message because in the end, you know, they're also connected to us um, from what I understand how you how you described it. So, so these messages, um, why do you think we're getting the, these wake up calls right now? And what other messages do you think that people should know about that may may not have had these experiences yet? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think that you don't you don't have to take ayahuasca to realize that we're, you know, as a species, we're in deep trouble. Yeah. You know, uh, with respect to our position on the planet, what we're doing to the planet. I mean, climate change is a, a real thing and mm -hmm. it's happening more rapidly than anyone predicted. And uh and the effects are going to be profound. I mean, we're already seeing this, you know, all you have to do is turn on the news and, you know, California is on fire. The West coast is on fire. The East coast is underwater and devastated. And, and, you know, and that's pretty much true other places in the world as well. And I think, I mean, in some ways, that's why for me, Lately, these ayahuasca experiences have been not so uplifting. They've been kind of terrified because they seem to bring that into focus, you know. And and again, they are a wake up call, uh, but you have to take it to wake up, you know. And and then I guess you can try and propagate the message to other people. I, I'm not somebody that says every if everyone took ayahuasca, everything would be fine. Mm. You know, but I think it would help. I think that that essentials insight is important for people to to integrate and realize. I mean, as you probably know, if you've listened to my talks, you know, we we not only have to wake up. I mean, that's step one. We have to wake up. We have to acknowledge mm -hmm. what is going on, that we are really facing a crisis here and the narrow the window to do something about it uh, effectively is getting narrower and narrower, you know, and right now it's like, maybe if we're lucky, we have 20 years, you know, if we're lucky, that's probably unrealistically optimistic. It's more like 10 years where we reach a point, a threshold where we say, well, you know, we can't stop it now. We can't do anything about it now. You know, we, and so, you know, so the, the game or the, the challenge becomes to adapt rather than try to correct. We still have the opportunity to correct, but in order to do that, a whole bunch of people have to wake up, you know, uh, particularly the people that are in a position to make changes, you know, mm -hmm. And, the, and unfortunately, those are the people least likely to wake up, yeah. you know, least likely to take ayahuasca, for example, or least likely to, uh, you know, admit that climate change is a real, a real issue. And, and not only that, it's probably the paramount issue that we face. I mean, we're talking about the survival of the planet here. And uh, people that who are very interested in, or invested, I guess the word is, in uh, the, the, the status quo, you know, the fossil fuel companies, the, the whole political industrial infrastructure that runs things, and people want that to persist because, but, you know, it can't persist. It has to be changed in radical ways. So people that uh, 
take ayahuasca and have these insights. They have, they have the insights, but many of them are really powerless to do much about it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the trick, I think, the challenge is that not only to have the insight, but then somehow propagate that message mm-hmm. outside the bubble. You know, I sometimes think that people who are involved in psychedelics, it's a kind of a bubble in a certain way. And, and it's just, and I think there are, uh, you know, there's learning to be done there, but I worry sometimes, are we in this bubble and is this not getting out to anybody and, and people that are not in the bubble, not psychedelic, not concerned with these things, you know, they don't know about it and they don't give a damn. So yeah. that's concerning. But then, on the other hand, you can look at the the sort of the rapid uh, change in in the public perception about psychedelics and the the acceptance that it's finding now. People are beginning to admit they're beginning to wake up to the fact that it has therapeutic properties. You mm-hmm. know, that's always the you know, that's always good. That's That makes for good PR. They do have therapeutic properties, but it goes beyond that. You know, I mean, psychedelics are catalysts in the evolution of our species. You know, they're both, they're co-evolutionary partners with us. And it's always been that, uh, you know, they propagate a message of, of harmony with nature and waking up to, to this. But before now, they've been pretty much marginalized. You know, they've been under the stewardship of uh, indigenous people who are the people on the edge, the people that are ignored in most instances. Mm. But now it's beginning to penetrate into global culture. And that's, this is why ayahuasca has gone global. Uh, you know, mushrooms have gone global and and, you know, people are trying to, found new companies based on ayahuasca therapy and, and this uh, not ayahuasca therapy so much, but psychedelic therapy. So these are all hopeful signs, you know, yeah. the question is, is it happening quickly enough? And that's where I uh, have concerns. Yeah. And I kind of quickly wanted to take like a road down history lane to give people some context around how you actually came across to these concepts and so your late brother, Terrence McKenna, brilliant mind, amazing, amazing, amazing person. <laughs> uh, I really recommend people hear his his talks as well as yours. But you guys, so you wrote this book, um, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. I was getting the, the name backwards. The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. And you kind of recounted this story, uh, very historical of what happened during those, you know, formative years when you guys were first going up into the Amazons, meeting the shamans for the first time, taking these medicines for the first time. And, you know, I wanted to know just what was going through your mind at that point and not even just going through your mind, but what paradigm shifts were you making about the world that have kind of sticked with you since those experiences and what you were having uh, what you were talking about with Terrence during these times, I imagine those were super, super fascinating conversations. Well, they were fascinating conversations. And uh, I, you know, I have to, uh, uh, you know, I, I have to kind of correct you. We, it's, it's not like, here's the thing, Emilio. Mm-hmm. It's not like we knew what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we were fascinated by psychedelics and we had a number of ideas about psychedelics that were basically delusions mm-hmm. and not based on reality, I think. I mean, the, one of the things that's seductive about about psychedelics is that you it, you can get go down the rabbit hole and uh you know and uh form ideas about what they're about and and some of the ideas that come up and which do not stand up in the cold hard light of non-intoxicated 
uh, states of consciousness, you know, uh, and and there was a lot of that going on when when we were there. We were hardly, uh, uh, you know, reductionist analytical thinkers. We were ready to accept whatever insights we got, and some of the insights were just. I mean, let's face it, flat out bonkers, hmm. you know, and we're not really valid. Others, though, I think are uh, do hold up over yeah. time, you know. So the idea, for example, just as a trivial example, the idea that uh, mushrooms are extraterrestrial, hmm. you know, and I mean, I'm sorry, they're not. You know, <laughs> they're just not. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't defend that based on any facts that we know, because we know that mushrooms, you know, are, I mean, we can look at where they fit in the phylogeny of, of life on the planet. We know what they evolved from. We pretty much know that these are, you know, using molecular signatures and this sort of thing. I mean, they are terrestrial for sure. Mm. That doesn't make them any less miraculous. Something doesn't have to come from, from outer space to be pretty cool. I think mm. it's even, it's even in some ways more interesting that, you know, the mushrooms uh, evolved this molecule psilocybin and they did so long before there were any primates around, long before there was anybody like us around, you know. Uh, they evolved, the Cidiomycetes as a class were, have been around for about 75 million years. And we only showed up about 2 million years ago. And then it mm. took another, it took 2 million years to evolve to the state that we're in now, this highly perfected state, not, but, but, you know, with complex brains and, and language and culture and all of these things. So what was the psilocybin doing there in the mushrooms while it was, well, before there was any primates around to appreciate it, hmm. you know, uh, because it had to have a purpose, you know, for the mushroom. I mean, uh, in general, in nature, it, nature does not waste time making chemicals yeah. that uh, are expensive to make on the on the metabolic level. You know, they require chemical resources like ATP and so on. So psilocybin had to have a function in the mushroom, and and when primates came around, then they discovered it, and then that became another. You know, that became another way that mushrooms could interface with uh, other things in the environment. You know, these, mm. these, these compounds are, are uh, you know, they mediate symbiosis is what they do, mm. you know, with us. And, uh, but before there was us, you know, Always what, using them. Yeah. Or what did or, psilocybin do for the mushrooms? Most yeah. likely it was related to their insect relationships. They were either, uh, they were either repellents for the insects or more. I mean, some people have suggested that, you know, insects, flies and this sort of thing feed on the mushrooms and then they get confused. Yeah, they're getting, <laughs> getting they, trips out there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're tripping balls and they can't find their way home, you know? And so that's, you know, that's effective protection for the mushroom. They yeah. could just turn it and just as well turn it around and say, well, if insects come and, feed on the mushrooms if they eat them then they pick up the spores and they disperse the spores and and that serves the mushrooms purpose too hmm. you know i mean i think if you forget the whole you know extraterrestrial hypothesis that it's it's you know representing some super civilization that it's just a fungal species that wants to symbiose with us i mean if mushrooms have an agenda like like most life on the planet, they just want to grow, you know, and they want, they want to spread. And, uh, and we're particularly efficient at, uh, at facilitating that process, you know, now that we have formed this symbiosis, uh, you know, they're being cultivated everywhere. They're, you know, they're, they're, and, and this is a, something that goes on really with anything that we domesticate, you know, to domesticate mm. a plant or a fungus or an animal or whatever is essentially to 
form a symbiosis with it. That's yeah. what that's what you're doing. And usually that partner benefits. You know, if we uh, form a partnership with mushrooms because they produce psilocybin, which we happen to appreciate in various ways. Hmm. Well, we grow the mushrooms, so that serves the mushrooms' purpose as well, yeah. and uh, and it's like that. That same dynamic happens in any kind of symbiotic uh, relationship. Yeah, is there so that apart makes from? Sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, apart from the human species, are there species uh, right now that have also found this symbiotic relationship with? with psilocybin and, and the mushrooms or is it has it been primarily humans because maybe just to go off a detour i know you you talk a lot about this a stone aped theory and i wanted to kind of get into that mm -hmm. a little bit maybe just touch upon it and know if you've had uh different angles of looking at it since you last spoke about it i know i know you talked about it on the joe rogan podcast on fantastic fungi the Netflix documentary. Right. So has there been, um, you know, any new angles of how you've looked at this theory since, since you started talking about it and thinking about it? Yeah. Yes. Yes, there have, uh, not, not that so much recent. I mean, the stone date theory, uh, in part, I mean, it, if it had an origin, it, it was in, uh, Terence's book, Food of the Gods, mm. which, which you probably have read. And that was published in 1992, I believe. Mm -hmm. And where he, that's where he first suggested. And, you know, he and I, uh, I mean, he doesn't deserve total credit for this idea. We kind of evolved this idea together. Mm. And I, I'd been talking to him about the evolutionary significance of psychedelics, you know, before the book was even written. Yeah. And he wrote the book and uh, came out with this crazy idea that, you know, evolving primates, possibly millions of years ago, lived in an environment that in which mushrooms were present and they consumed these things. And it had it essentially helped them help the, them to become conscious, help them to learn language and cognition and the ability to imagination essentially mm -hmm. the ability to internalize visual information that's meaningful and you know have visions but not not simply visions visions that actually carry gnosis that carry yeah. meaning and transcend language as well and like and transcend the language but also facilitate language mm. in the effort to express these ideas right and uh uh, what's changed in that uh, since he wrote the book uh, are, are a couple of things. We're, we're actually going to, we plan to organize a, another uh, symposium on the stone date theory sometime this fall. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, things are pretty intense right now, but I do think we'll be able to find time. We keep pushing back the time, but I want to do another at least half day symposium on the stone date theory or whatever we end up calling it because primarily two things uh, have, have come to light since the book was, was published uh, in 1992. One of them is neuroplasticity. Yeah. And the other one is epigenetics and mm -hmm. neither one of these terms was used in 1992 nobody was thinking about this yeah. but neuroplasticity is important because it shows and this has been shown for psilocybin that that not only that the older thinking used to be that once you had a certain complement of neurons at a certain age nothing changed the only thing that happened after that was that you lost neurons you know yeah. but the brain's basic uh patterns of connection between neural systems and all that was set for life. Mm -hmm. That's out the window now. We know that uh, patterns of connectivity can change in response to environmental factors and in response to drugs. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin has been shown to 
increase the the internal connectivity of uh, of neural networks in the cortex and other parts of the brain. I mean, this this is fact. So, now. in this- simple terms, would that mean that the brain can actually learn quicker when they're when they're having these experiences? Effectively, or that it mm-hmm. may, yeah, that it makes the brain. Uh, I mean, a reflection of uh, learning is is can one way to quantify learning mm-hmm. is the number of connections, the number of synapses, and the psilocybin and presumably other psychedelics can actually increase the number of the number of neurons and the number of connections. You know, the brain is a connection machine. That's what it is. It evolved for signal transduction, and that's what that's what neurotransmitters do. You know, they facilitate communication between neurons in the brain. Uh, so, uh, so there's that. There is this these new discoveries which were not known at that time because we didn't have the Im- we didn't have the neural imaging tools that we yeah. have now. So we couldn't couldn't see that. So there's neuroplasticity. The brain can actually respond to environmental influences and, and, uh, and it's, it's, it can complexify as a result of exposure to compounds like psilocybin. So mm. that's one data point. The other data piece of data or a concept that was not discussed much in 1993 is epigenetics. Mm. And epigenetics provides a mechanism for these changes to be effectively inherited, but not over multiple generations without going through the usual mechanism of of mutation and inheritance of mutation, selection against that and that sort of thing. I mean, epigenetics is a way that these changes that take place could be made to, to stick, you know, Mm. over generations without actually requiring transmission through the usual uh, way we think of, of traits being inherited through sexual reproduction and inheritance of mutations. Some are better than others. I mean, that, that does go on, although it's, it's uh, epigenetics is emerging as a, at least as important a mechanism of evolutionary change as, as the conventional way. So these two things make the stoned ape hypothesis more, more likely rather than less likely. I mean, the stoned ape hypothesis, in my mind, but of course I'm biased, but in, in mm. my mind, I felt like it was always plausible, you know, Now I think my needle has shift from uh, plausible to more than likely because Mm -hmm. of these two mechanisms that Terence did not consider because they weren't really known about, or if they were, they weren't, they weren't talked about much by non-specialists. So, so that's made a difference, you know, and we know uh, based on other evidence, we know uh, about, you know, about 2 million years ago from, it took approximately 2 million years for the brain to increase in size and complexity, uh, increase in three times in size, and each, each increment in size ref- is reflected by greater complexity of these networks. So, you know, the earliest hominids back at 2 million years ago lived in an environment that... Uh, uh, it was much wetter than the desert it is now, talking about northern Africa. It mm-hmm. lived, you know, there was more rainfall. It was essentially a tropical environment. And in that environment, there was there were animals, cattle-like animals, essentially the ancestors of modern cattle, uh, that were in the same in the same area. If this was a uh, you know a plains dwelling species, not living in the in the forest, living on the plains, they were hunting those animals. They were you know that was probably a major food source. But the the dung of the animals is the preferred substrate for the psilocybin mushroom, uh, or psilocybin cubensis, right? So mm-hmm. it is uh, not 
it's more than likely that there were mushrooms in this environment uh, at yeah. that time. All the other pieces were in place. And, you know, you have foraging hungry primates that are, uh, you know, happy to eat anything that looks like it might be edible. Yeah. Especially if it makes them trip to, <laughs> to another right. planet. And then, and then what, once they eat it, you know, mm. accidentally or otherwise, then... Yeah, the light, you know, the lights come on, and it's oh wow, you know, and and they discover this internal, internal landscape, essentially the realm of the imagination, yeah. and that uh, I think was the trigger that that led us cross the threshold. You know, it's it's all based on, you know, the I, I mean, how do you define consciousness? You know, you can define it different ways, but I think that one uh, useful definition is what we do essentially is we create an artificial world, an artificial reality mm. that we inhabit. I call it the reality hallucination. Yeah. It's sometimes called the, uh, the default mode network these days, but mm. it's not reality itself. It's a map of reality. It's something the brain constructs so that we can, adapt to reality you know if if it's a filter as much as it is a gate mm. you know it lets information in very selectively and constructs a sort of uh uh schematic of reality which is unknowable right but but our our model of reality is comprehensible and it helps us uh you know navigate in in that reality well the ability to create this this reality hallucination which is an internalized uh set of thoughts and ideas and so on that to me equates to consciousness i don't think other animals do this you know mm -hmm. i think this is a uniquely human trait yeah you talk a lot about and i've heard you mention how Terence was able to go inside and out of the matrix and just um, going off the fact that the matrix will be releasing a new movie very soon. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what is, what is your view on, on that matrix concept and how have you kind of witnessed and experienced living in a matrix, living in this um, reality that's could be simulated by our mind and it's, from the inside to the outside. How have you um, played around with that concept? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're all in the matrix. We're all in the matrix that our minds create, you know, mm. this artificial reality. But because there is, you know, uh, similar, I mean, because it's not like we're isolated from influence from other people and so on. Mm. People generally tend to see and interpret the world in, in ways that, that can be understood and are generally agreed on, you know? And so there must be something out there that is the real objective reality and what we experience is our interpretation of it. But then it's very similar to other people's interpretation. So in that sense, I guess we are living in the matrix, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a matrix imposed from the outside. I think it's a matrix that is uh, uh, effectively uh, imposed by our own uh, world building on the internal level, mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. I know you're on the cutting edge of this research and there's a lot of, as you mentioned, a lot of companies that are getting into the, these, um, you know, psychedelic experience, treating things like anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, like things mm -hmm. um, that could benefit a lot of, of the mental illnesses that are, you know, plaguing the planet. And I wanted to ask you right now, since you're so involved in the future of, of the use of this medicine, what have you seen um, in this landscape that we can expect in the years to come and things that are kind of tipping the point so that more people can get to know about this, more people can, um, you know, make that symbiotic relationship with the plants and elevate the consciousness of our species? 
Well, uh, in the first place, uh, you know, this this emergence of psychedelics into uh, biomedicine and now the focus on the therapeutic uses of psychedelics. Uh, I'm not really at the forefront of that. <laughs> I, mm. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm watching along with everybody else, but, yeah. but that's, I'm not working with a company that's trying to develop new psychedelics or anything. My, uh, my role, I feel like my role in this space is to help educate people Mm. Uh, about them. I mean, I'm delighted that it's happening, but I think it's also their pitfalls. You know, I mean, these are powerful medicines. They can be used or misused. They can be exploited for the wrong reasons or not, you know, so they're not, uh, you know, uh, you have to have clarity about the way that you approach the, the beneficial mm. use of these medicines. I don't think all the companies that are doing this necessarily have thought about this mm. too deeply, you know? So, so I think that's important. I think that's important for people to, uh, you know, try to form clarity about how these are going to fit in. These compounds are never about take two and call me in the morning. You know, they can always be used. They must be used in the context of therapy you know, intense yeah. time with a therapist to help people through the prepare for it and then have the experience and then integrate the experience if they're doing it for, uh, you know, to treat mental disorders. But psychedelics go beyond that, you know. Uh, I mean, they, they can be, they are used, they can be used for uh, simply what Bob Jesse is called betterment of the well. You don't have to be sick to take a psychedelic. Anyone can learn from the psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so in the realm of expansion of consciousness or the exploration of consciousness, I think people should have access to them for that reason, you know, for that purpose. You shouldn't have to uh, you know, declare that you're mentally ill in order to get access to a psychedelic therapy. I think that it's a human right to have access to this therapy. If we're talking about the, the natural psychedelics, the plants and the fungi, mm. as we said before, these are kinds of, uh, these are forms of symbiosis. Yeah. And I, I've been uh, advocating that that symbiosis should be proclaimed as a right, uh, not more than a human right, because we're talking about alliances with uh, organisms that are not humans. So let's call it an organismic right. And any organism should have the right to form a symbiosis with any other organism, as long as it doesn't cause harm. Yeah. So one of the... Uh, encouraging developments I've seen lately is the, the, the so-called decrim movements that are taking place in this country and Canada, the idea just not to prohibit these things, you know, that, and, and before it's always been defined by drug policy and these, these things were prohibited and banned and, and there were even aspirations to eradicate them from the face of the earth, mm -hmm. you know, and this is not a good idea. You know, who gave us the authority to do that? Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's better to, uh, so I, I think between these, I think the decrim movements are interesting because it, you know, it affords the possibility of more open access to things like ayahuasca and psilocybin and so on without having to risk going to jail. So that's kind of relieves anxiety, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and because the access is opening up, more people will have these experiences and, and, and they will, it, it's the first step toward integrating these things into global society, which has never really had anything quite like this. You know, these things have always been under the stewardship of indigenous groups, indigenous communities. Now it's gone global and, and integrated it into global culture mm -hmm. 
is going to be a challenge, but it is it is happening whether we like it or not. And mm. uh, you know, in, in, so you're going to look at some instances where it was done right, and some instances where you know they totally botched it. I mean, these are these are sp- powerful spiritual technologies, you know, and mm. like I love that you call them technologies. I, I love that. Well, they are technologies. Yeah, just yeah, absolutely, they're technologies, mm. and and like any technology, they can be used beneficially or they can be misused for harm. They, that's the thing. This is my my rant, if you will. Hmm. You know, which you probably heard if you listen to my stuff. I don't know how you stand it. I mean, I only say so many things, but but one of the things I emphasize is that the uh, in the use of technology of any kind, hmm. there's a moral dimension. You know, but the moral dimension originates with us. You know, it's not inherent in the technology. Like everybody, mm-hmm. and that's been a problem when it comes to drugs very often because they that important uh, uh, recognition is is overlooked. And then so they talk about, oh, you know, these are really bad drugs, right? Yeah. These are, and then you say, we are drugs. <laughs> and we are drugs. We are made out of drugs, you know, mm-hmm. and we're essentially biochemical systems that run on hormones, neurotransmitters, uh, mm-hmm. and other types of messenger molecules. That's why drugs work in us, you know. But people say, you know, I mean, like something like heroin or cocaine or easily abusable drugs, methamphetamine, what it, whatever, you know, people say, well, you know, these are bad drugs. These are terrible drugs. Well, they're not. It, it's a misunderstanding. The drugs are simply what they are. The drugs have the action that they have. But there are n- numerous bad ways to use drugs, <laughs> mm. and people do. And that's the thing, that the moral dimension of the use of any technology comes from within us and the decisions we made and the choices that we make about how to exploit how to exploit or whether to use these technologies. So this is what I, you know, uh, I've often said uh, that, uh, you know, that we have to, that our cleverness has outstripped our wisdom in Mm. this respect. And that we uh, have been very clever at developing technologies that, uh, like any technologies, they're two-edged source. They can be misused or used for benefit. When misused, some of these things are so powerful, like genetic engineering, nuclear energy, you know, these kinds of things. If not used properly, they could destroy the world or they could certainly make have a, a bad you know, influence. So What we lack is wisdom. We have to focus on getting the wisdom that goes along with the cleverness. Right now, we're very clever monkeys and we're really stupid monkeys. Hmm. That's a problem. You know, we have to be clever and wise. And, and, you know, we've demonstrated that we're quite clever. We have Hmm. not demonstrated that we're very wise. And in fact, every day, you can read the newspaper, or watch the news, and and see all kinds of you know examples that show that we're not very wise. We're not being wise uh, in the face of the challenge that we face. So, yeah. so maybe the psychedelics can provide some uh, lessons about that. They can mm-hmm. help us to wake up and and wise up. Yeah, and where does where does wisdom begin for you? Uh, where does wisdom begin? It begins, well, you said wisdom begins in wonder. I think mm. that's I think that's part of it. I didn't say that. I think Socrates said that. I think it's important to be curious, to preserve a sense of wonder. I mean, even though everything is fucked up, we still live in a pretty marvelous world when you think about it, you know, and so we should appreciate that. And I think another thing that, that we should pay attention to in, in, in seeking wisdom to seeking 
to become wise is to recognize how little we know. You know, uh, and then, and that's a problem. Science, especially, is often quite arrogant about what it thinks it's no, know, it knows, and what it knows is great, but it's only a tiny slice of reality. You know that we understand in depth. So science needs to remind itself that, you know, however, however much we expand the sphere of understanding that it seeks to create. There's an infinite number of things that are outside that sphere that we do not understand. So, so a little humility would be useful, you yeah. know. Uh, and it doesn't have to be shame. It's just acknowledging that we don't know everything, you know. Mm. And uh, and that can be a good thing because then you can say, well, okay, uh, you know, we know what we don't know. We can try to expand the sphere of our knowledge, but we shouldn't assume that we have it all figured out because we don't, you know, yeah. we just simply don't. And, uh, and again, going back to Socrates, I mean, he was a wise person in many ways. That was his, that was his whole thing. It was like in these, in these dialogues that he had, his basic stance was, I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, so yeah. enlighten me, inform me, you know, teach me. Hmm. And that's a good way to uh, approach nature, to ask that same thing of, of nature. You know, yeah. I effectively know nothing. What can I learn by observing? What can I learn from nature? Yeah, and it's like that intention going in. What can I learn from this plant? What is it trying to teach me? And what are the things just going like running off the the topic of the technologies we've heard a lot these billionaires inventors ceos that have been effectively using um these psychedelics in 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 micro doses or in general having these experiences to come up with new solutions that the world needs um mm -hmm. taking an optimistic route like they're using these plants and in a way you could say that maybe these plants are also co-creating the future of the technology that we're building with us in order for, you know, the plant to heal and, and, and get saved. What is your view on that? Um, have you, have you had the chance to talk to any of these guys in Silicon Valley that are using these um, psychedelics that have come to you and said, Hey, I had this insight. Look what, look what these plants have taught me and what we can build and, and, and make the future better. Well, no, not really. I mean, I, I've talked to some of them, but I, I do think that they're sources of, of new ideas and, and uh, they, can, uh, they can help our interpretation of nature and our understanding of nature. Uh, there's a very interesting writer who, who uh, has written several books on psilocybin. I, I don't know if he's... Stop doing that. He's he's not been uh, talked about much lately, but his name is Simon Powell. And he wrote, uh, started out with a book called The Psilocybin Solution. Mm. And then he wrote another book called Darwin's Unfinished Business, How Intelligence Manifests in Nature. And then his latest one, which was a few years ago now, it was called The Magic Mushroom Explorer. Yeah. Anyway, I recommend people read his books. But in his books, he said some things that I thought were very interesting, which is that you can think of something like psilocybin or ayahuasca or any of these things, but say, say psilocybin, because that's what he was writing about, as a lens through which you can examine nature. It's a, it's a way to shift your perspective a bit. That's what these things do. And so you can take psilocybin and you can look at a phenomenon in nature. You can go out into the forest and just sit quietly and observe what's happening. And you'll notice that there's a lot of things happening that you never noticed before, you know, because you weren't tuned into it. And it's not that these are not delusions. These are not hallucinations. These are the details of existence that you've opened your mind and, and given yourself permission to like quiet your mind and just be respect receptive of those impressions. And when you do that, you, you can 
notice product. You know, I sometimes say I put it that they psychedelics can bring the background forward. Mm. You know, we're, we're programmed to be focused on the background, on the on the foreground. Yeah. You know, whatever's in front of you. You know, the book you're reading, the person you're talking to, the road you're driving on. All of these. Uh, uh, in normal waking life, they tend to uh, focus attention, you know, and it's important to be able to focus attention. But the sacrifice you make is that you then, in order to be attentive on top of something, you have to ignore everything in the background that's going on, which may be important too. But, you know, we're programmed not to, uh, uh, not to afford it any importance. So psychedelics mm -hmm. are tools by which you can reverse that equation and you can just kind of open up without any particular agenda, just be open up to the impressions that come in. If you take uh, say psilocybin in a natural environment, you're going to notice things that are always going on. It's not that they're not there. It's just that you never noticed them before. Yeah. And, you know, if you're an in indigenous person, particularly if you're not literate, I think literacy is an impediment to this in a certain sense, or, mm -hmm. or if you're a child, you know, you have this openness, you know, you're not, mm -hmm. you're not uh, trying to force everything into a, an attentional and necessarily, you know, impoverished, uh, uh, you know, zone of, of perception. You can just open up, the barriers effectively you default you 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 know we would say you disable the default mode network is is yeah. another way to put it in in neuroscience terms you know the default mode network being essentially this pattern of behaviors uh and memories and habits and uh, a way of being in the world that makes it makes it comprehensible mm. uh and it's it's very useful to have a default mode network. That's what we operate out of most of the time. Sometimes though, you just want to turn it off. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like turning the volume down. Mm. And then what can you hear when the volume is turned down? You know, what, what comes in? So I think psychedelics are useful for that. I mean, meditation is another way you can approach that. Anything that lets you let go and just open up and just be quiet and receptive, momentarily suppress that ego. And mm. uh, I, I think this is a useful, this is one of the ways psychedelics are most useful. Yeah. I'm so happy you said the word ego because that's some a topic that I've really looked into and I've read this book um, by Eckhart Tolle. And he talks a lot about that, the sense of self. And I'm really interested just, I know we're, we're going past the hour just to wrap up, kind of getting your perspective on your own sense of self. Who is Dennis? You know, you've gone through so many of these experiences. You've <laughs> dissolved that ego. What do you perceive as you, as yourself, your, your personality, and how have you changed the relationship you have to it? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's these are complex questions of... I, I think I'm a more uh, I'm I'm a, I'm more humble. I hope I, I I hope that I'm more humble because I have I think internalized the understanding that I really don't know anything and nobody else does either. So so you know that can create a sense of openness and a certain joy in knowing that. We don't have it all figured out, and that we don't actually have to have it figured out. That's not necessarily what we're what we're supposed to be doing. We're, I think we're more like supposed to be appreciating our experience, knowing that it's always limited. You know, there is there is you know there is no answer that we're journeying for or any insight. The journey is the is the answer. It's the quest. You know, and so in that sense, uh, you know, in my own mind, I, I say there's nothing special about me particularly. You know, I mean, I maybe have more questions than other people, but I think asking questions 
And being curious is, is a good thing to be, you know, because it propels learning. Uh, 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 being curious is at the basis of science. I mean, this is what drives science, basically, mm -hmm. and what drives discovery in general. It's like, I wonder how that works, how that works, or why this is happening. You can, you know, you can look at phenomena in nature, which may seem very trivial, you know, uh, why do leaves turn red in the fall, you know, trivial question. But you can look into that and you can learn a lot. So, so these, these uh, questions powered by curiosity is really what advanced learning and understanding and, and, and expansion of our consciousness in a certain way. Mm. You know, the more that you know, the more that you've in, incorporated into your kind of knowledge sphere, you know, it's important to realize, number one, it's not set, it's constantly changing, you know. Mm. But the more that you know and can relate to, the more interesting your experience becomes, you know? I mean, that's one of the advantages of uh, one of the benefits of having an education. You know, there's more to think about and you can relate your experiences to more things. So, uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I, I, I am, I'm just another curious monkey. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that brother. I wanted to leave people off. Um, we have a final question at the end, a very short one. But just to highlight what you're doing right now in the world, which is fascinating. I know you're starting up this academy. You're, you're having these courses on ethnopharmacology, everything that you're finding and discovering. I just wanted to let, leave people with what you're working on right now. What excites you right now? What are you most passionate about bringing into the world in, in your newest projects? And how can we connect to it? Well, you can connect through the academy, right? So I can, you know, you probably got the website, but uh, you can just put, uh, you know, McKenna, if you could spell it right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. No worries. Right. Right. Just tell people to go here and they can see what we're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I wish that the, uh, uh, I, yeah, you, you get it. I can't type it properly <laughs> here, but uh, uh, we're, we're doing a number of things. I mean, because it's an academy, uh, we're all about education and uh, we're, we're, trying to educate people about this relationship with nature, about our relationship to plant wisdom, to plant medicines, and also to, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge and that sort of thing. And we're trying to bridge what you might call ancestral wisdom with contemporary scientific knowledge. So mm -hmm. we're just out there freely exploring ideas, you know, and, and whatever seems cool, And, uh, and also related to this idea that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, I guess, foster, promote the, the, our re rediscovery and realignment with nature and uh, create a forum for the exchange of ideas and knowledge in terms of how, how we might do that. So. Yeah. That, that's what it is. We have a number of uh, projects underway right now and war planned. As I said, we're going to have a symposium on the stoned ape theory. Mm. Uh, if you go to the website and look at the events tab, you can look at some of the past events we've done, plus many, many podcasts. I mean, I'm astounded when I go there how many third party podcasts I've done, but like this one, for example, it will go up. This there. is the favorite one. <laughs> well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. But, you know, and I don't mind. I mean, I, I'm, I like talking to people like you and doing these third party sort of third party yeah. things, but just check out the events page and, uh, and mm -hmm. look at the past and then, and sign up for the newsletter to keep in touch with the, uh, what we're planning for the future. 
Yeah, and you guys have an awesome mission. You say that the Academy's mission is to advance a symbiotic and evolutionary partnership with the entire planetary community of sentient species. And you really want to bring what you call the message from Gaia's ad ambassadors, the, the plant teachers that are here for us to co-evolve, to help expand our consciousness so we don't end up tearing down this planet. And one of the final questions I wanted to ask you, and I've heard you talk a lot about how we always have this inner sage within us. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really quickly tap into your inner sage and kind of unveil what would be sort of your, your final messages to the future generations, the future leaders of the world, so they can kind of turn this shit around. And as you say, evolve, keep growing. And what do we need to know? What would you tell your younger self um, in this position? Well, there's a lot. I, we could get into this for another half hour uh, at least. But uh, what mind. I'm going to do is actually I'm going to direct you to the blog on my website and a piece I wrote after I did the uh, interview with Tim Ferriss, which was mm. not too long ago. I recommend that interview. He's a great interviewer. We had a fantastic time. And then I wrote a blog about that. And uh, the name of the, the title of the blog was called Remember to Remember. Mm. And it discusses a lot of what you just touched on. For one thing, remember to be grateful. You know, we're blessed in so many ways. Remember that, you know, we are monkeys uh, and we shouldn't forget that. Actually, I think I left that part out, unfortunately. <laughs> but remem remember, again, this message from, from ayahuasca and the psychedelics, re remember how little you know, you know, mm -hmm. and thus how much there is to learn. And learning is a joyous activity for me, I enjoy, and, and it should be for everyone if they're learning in the right way. And then the other thing, I guess, the, the thing is to just appreciate what a really sort of, I mean, if we're living in a matrix or not, I, I can't tell you if we're living in a matrix or not. I can tell you that we live in a marvelous world that's astonishing in every way, every day, something new kind of comes onto the radar that has never before happened in the history of the universe. That's pretty amazing. So like that, you know? Yeah. Dennis, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know we okay. were, you know, we were um, trying to make this this happen for a while. And I'm really grateful that you decided to um, give this a shot. And I know that the message that you have for us is super important. And I hope we can do this again. If I ever decide to do an ayahuasca experience, it would be with you. So let me know and we can okay, set something we'll up when the when the when the world opens up but yeah stay would... tuned we'll be doing that <laughs> one of these days we'll be doing it again and oh you're in colombia so you're right in the middle of yeah i'll just know, take a drive down to wherever you're gonna be <laughs> uh, absolutely probably in peru but, but uh yeah thank you so much this has been a great conversation and we'll come back on this one of these days so yes. uh let me know when it's posted and we'll get it on our social media and spread the word for sure for sure okay